Yeah. All right, we're going live. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in with us today in our uh, last, or at least for now, last chat about affordable housing in Athens, um, brought to you by the Athens area DSA, uh, Democratic Socialists of America, and Athens for Everyone. I'm Erin Stacer, and our guest today is Commissioner of Athens District 6, Jesse Houle. Hey, Jesse. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Hopefully not the last one, just the last one for now. Yeah, yeah. we'll see. It'd be kind of cool to keep these conversations going with various officials and whatnot. But uh, you are, are one of several commissioners who were able to join us just schedule-wise, and we really appreciate mm -hmm. your time. Um, so let's hop right into this thing. All right. Um, so the way we've been starting these is getting the commissioners to give us their take on kind of the picture of housing in Athens, keeping in mind that this is about affordable housing, but kind of if you could give a snapshot, if you will, about uh, the way that you see housing, and then we can talk about like how things got to be the way they are, and hopefully go into like solutions. Okay. Uh, well, the short version, I think, of how I see housing is we're in a bit of a housing crisis. And uh, while a lot of that is the result of housing being treated as a commodity in a, you know, capitalist system where private property is kind of the only thing that we know is going to appreciate over time and, you know, wealth concentrated in fewer and fewer hands is certainly a, a major driving factor, but there's also local interventions. So I, I wouldn't say that locally we have the power to um, just completely subvert the way housing works. Um, that's like a broader societal challenge. Um, but locally, there's a lot we can do to make things better, I think. Um, and when we talk about the crisis, or when I talk about the crisis, I guess, um, around affordability, you know, homelessness is a huge part of that. Of course, there's a wide variety of reasons for why people might not have housing or formal housing. And for some people, that's by choice. But for many people, it's not and speaks to the variety of reasons why people can be in precarity. But there's also a lot of people who are just in housing precarity, who are on the verge of perhaps losing their housing. Um, and, you know, thankful that the eviction uh, moratorium by the CDC has been extended. Um, but it is important to point out that the courts are going to be reopening soon and that there's a whole host of folks who can still be evicted because if you haven't applied and succeeded at getting approved for that specific program that the CDC set up, then you can still be evicted. So it's not like all evictions have been staved off. So that's a major challenge that we've certainly got to take head on. Um, and the rent just keeps going up and up and up and up. Uh, and, you know, the same is true for property taxes a bit. You know, the issues of gentrification driving up the cost of housing for people overall and driving people further and further out of the neighborhoods that grow to become very desirable for a variety of reasons. Um, so, again, there's certain things we can do locally to mitigate some of the worst of that. Um, Georgia is a particularly difficult state to try to do this in as a locality because there's a lot of preemptive state laws that make it that much more challenging where we just outright can't do some stuff or we have to be real creative with other stuff. Um, but there certainly are things that we can do that we're not yet doing. Um, and so I'm excited to talk about some of that with you today if you'd like. Absolutely. Yeah. That's why we're here, I guess. <laughs> Pretty much. Hopefully we can, we can come to um, some agreement also with your colleagues about what, what solutions look like. But um, one of the first things, unless you had something you wanted to jump off with right away. I'd love for you to lead and for whoever in the comments wants to share some things. I see someone critiquing Fred, I think from Fred's properties there. Um, so uh, yeah, you know, while I, I'm not gonna stand here and try to defend any one very wealthy landowner, uh, I will say that I don't think that he's particularly unique in terms of his motivations or reasons for driving up the cost of housing on people. So there are many threads. There are many threads. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, if we're talking about um, kind of wealthy people buying up these lands and, and using them for things like um, renting them to students. Right. So like mm -hmm. I see that in my neighborhood, it's all over. Mm -hmm where these these homes uh, are easily purchased by, by wealthy people who don't even really mm -hmm. live in Athens. A lot of them don't. Um, and they just rent them out uh, by the bedroom 
for like, you know, $700, $800 a bedroom uh, and make a really good profit off of that. So how mm -hmm. do you save that off from your position? Whew. Uh, well, you know, one thing that we really need to do is tackle the shortage of housing, you know, because it's a commodity, housing is treated like a commodity. The lack of abundance of housing being available is part of what drives up the cost of housing on people. Um, so I think one of the grand ironies for me that I feel like I've really learned in recent months, and I'm, this isn't normally where I'd start in this question, but I think I'm going to start here because it feels newer for me, is that um, housing for students isn't actually a bad thing if we're trying to get more housing for non-students because it gives the, the ever-growing student population a place to go to free up space in those houses that you're talking about. And where we're seeing that play out especially so is in the east side and in uh, Mariah's district, you know, so district two. Um, there's just a lot of houses that people are um, unable to afford you know, the rent in unless they're a student and they have their income subsidized usually by, you know, there's a lot of wealthier students. I mean, it's also important to point out, I think that not all students are rich, but uh, a large number of the people who come here at the University of Georgia do have subsidized incomes from their parents, um, usually in like wealthier suburbs of Atlanta or elsewhere in the state. And the University of Georgia has made very clear that they're not building housing anymore, which is basically signaling to the private sector, like you get to build it. There is some recent state laws passed that give extra tax breaks to people building student housing, like large scale student housing. So there's incentives for the private sector to be building this. And we have what I like to call a deregulated market here in Athens, where um, you can build really large things by right without having to provide affordability in the units or having to make them particularly environmentally sustainable, et cetera. So I think, you know, the short summary of what we can do as a local government is shrink down what is allowed to be built by right and then provide incentives where basically you're allowed to build bigger or denser if you do blank. And blank is provide X number of affordable units and uh, undergo XYZ sustainability measures. And, um, and then that opens a series of cans of worms around how we define affordability, how we define those percentages, whether it's based on beds or bedrooms uh, or units, and also um, you know, what we think a, a good trade-off is there. And so inclusionary zoning is usually the overarching term you'll hear people use for this sort of thing. Inclusionary zoning, should I, should I pause here? Sorry, I'm just kind of going off. <laughs> uh, uh, you're bringing up a lot of stuff that, that we have like kind of mentioned, which is great because now, uh -huh. especially since I've gotten more uh, used to it, I can kind of be like, okay, let's like get deeper into yeah, that. Yeah. Um, because as I recall, we actually cannot do inclusionary zoning actually here. Sort of, yeah. So in other states, you can mandate the inclusion of affordable units. Uh, Georgia doesn't allow us to do that. So instead we have to incentivize it. But I would still describe it as inclusionary zoning measures, I guess, in that like you're saying in these types of zones, we're going to drive affordable units by being able to exercise these mechanisms. So I, generally we've still referred to that in Clark County when you hear us on the commission talking about this as inclusionary zoning, although it does look different here than it might in other states. Okay. And so you you spoke to like, the kind of leverage y'all might have is like, okay, we want you to do this many affordable units or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And oh, Mariah's put in the, the chat a really good point about the median household income in Athens being about 38,000. Yeah, that's not yeah. a lot. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, we'll get to wages. That's a big one I would like for us to, to, to chat more about. Um, but yeah. That's a big difference. Um, mm -hmm. as, as far as y'all being able to work out with developers, like what you want to see and kind of navigating that leverage, what else can you do to sort of shrink the build by right? Like, is there anything else that y'all have power over uh, to, to, as you, you said, shrink it down? So I was like, what does that, what does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, I mean, basically, like right now, you're allowed to build so high and so large and with so many units and di different types of zoning. And so if we were to, say, make that less large, um, 
and less high and fewer units that you can build by right. And then it's like, well, yeah, you, you, so let's say, let's say we do shrink that down um, and we, by passing inclusionary zoning measures. And then it's like, well, now you can build to the size that you used to just be able to build to by right if you do blank. Or what'll probably end up happening in all this is, you know, will say that you can build even bigger than you were able to before, but you're providing blank. So some of the negotiations that have happened with developers to try to get something back from them that really benefits the community <laughs> um, that's happened in recent months, have largely led by Commissioner Parker in many cases. And Commissioner Denson's been at the forefront of this a lot too. And also Mayor Gertz has been involved in a good, a good bit of these, mm -hmm. is to say like, all right, you're looking, you know, Right now, developers build a lot of stuff. One of the worst, most famous examples of this is the landmark developments on Oconee Street, just mm -hmm. by right. And that's that's what I mean by like, if we had, if we shrunk down what they could build by right, they couldn't build something that large without having to come to us for some kind of a variance, right? Which is like a, a change in the in the what they would just be allowed to do by right. Um, and so. A lot of times developers will seek out a plot of land that's zoned a certain way and they want to rezone it to be more dense, to be multifamily instead of single family or something like that. And so that's why they end up coming to us or they end up coming to us because they're encroaching upon a stream buffer or, or some other series of things, traffic calming that might be required, et cetera. And so it's in those scenarios where we have the opportunity to say, well, do we wanna do this or do we not? And that can be based on a whole variety of reasons, but I think the, the reasoning I try to use and I think an at this point now, I think a majority of my colleagues like to use is like, you've really got to give something back for the community that's a real benefit in order for us to give you the opportunity to build your thing, which at the end of the day is really just driven by profit, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so right now we're in a lot of these ad hoc negotiations because we don't have a policy that codifies what that would look like on the front end. And what would really be better for everyone, including the developers, is to have those policies laid out on the front end. It becomes a lot more transparent for the whole community to see it go through each stage without mm -hmm. having to have these negotiations. It's a lot less exhausting for everybody involved. Um, and it even, you know, it helps the development community, the develop, if we want to call them that, you know, it helps developers have an idea of what they can, what they can bring to the table, what they can offer. Um, is there, there's a committee that the mayor appointed who's actually kind of working on that? Yeah, 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 yeah. There's this, uh, I think he's called it a working group mm -hmm. and it's got six people on it. So it's got commissioners Denson and Parker and then Rick Parker from the Athens Housing Authority, Heather Benham from the Athens Land Trust and a couple of folks from the Planning Commission and Heather, Matt Hall and Alice Kinman are those people. Alice, Alice Kinman used to be a, um, a commissioner actually back in the day, but uh Heather, I think is it's really important to give Heather a shout out for the work she's done in a bunch of these uh, with the land trust to try to help with some of these negotiations to get contracts that actually work and where they can be held accountable. There's all these loopholes that you know developers can, if, if your contract's not written well, they can just change managers or owners and then all of a sudden the affordability goes out the window, right? And so like I've actually learned a lot from Heather on like what needs to be in these contracts to make them really work. Uh, and then Rick Parker and the Housing Authority have been good with things like the Bethel redevelopment is probably the most famous housing that people look to um, right now for like a model that would be, I say famous, but like the most well-known right now for a lot more affordable units. Um, what's tough about replicating that kind of model at the pace that the population in Athens is growing is that that took years of negotiating with like four different partners and also the county put up, you know, over $20 million to, to get us a seat at the table, you know? So that's not always gonna be the kind of leverage or time that we'll have, so. Right. Um, real quick, I wanted to circle back because Graham uh, had a comment earlier about we could enforce our two unrelated people rule. And I think that's an interesting point. It's one I think I disagree with, and I think you might also, Jesse, but it'd be very important to delve into why. Yeah. So. I think of the single family ordinance, uh, which is the thing that says you can't have two unrelated people as the uh, wrong tool for a problem that does need to be addressed. Um, but you know, really the issue around like where that came from was more about like unruly parties and things. Like what drove the passing of the single family ordinance when Heidi Davison was mayor was people largely in the five points community uh, not wanting students to keep moving into their neighborhoods and having all these raucous parties and stuff. And it was like, so we're just gonna make it illegal for 
unrelated people to live together to kind of stave off this kind of behavior. Um, really what would have been better is different and better enforcement mechanisms for other laws we already have on the books around parking and noise ordinances and garbage and litter and underage drinking, you know, things like that, <laughs> that we already had laws for. Um, but where, for example, with a noise ordinance, it's, uh, it's the resident that gets fined. And if instead we made it the landlord who gets fined, then that would kind of incentivize the landlord to really, you know, address the problem that's happening with their tenants, right? Um, or ideally you probably find both, but instead what was happening is you had like, they just, you know, charge a bunch of money at the door for a solo cup and then they use that money to pay for the fine they know they're going to get. No one cares. So, <laughs> um, so there was like a real kind of problem that people were dealing with, but I don't think this is the right solution. And, and one of the main reasons why is because it discriminates against people on a class basis, you know, especially as the cost of housing is going up, uh, regular folks who aren't trying to do anything, you know, real wacky, uh, just need roommates to afford to live in a place. Um, and you can't do that if there's more than two of you trying to afford a three bedroom place. You can't do that if a couple wants to live with another couple, but no one's married. You can't do that if a married couple even wants to live with another unmarried couple. Um, and, you know, then it also gets into the discriminatory aspect, which is that people have all kinds of ways of defining family. And I don't think that our business is to tell people what counts, especially in the rigid and kind of archaic way that we've defined it, which is just based on blood family and like with immediate levels of consanguinity, which is like, you know, aunts and uncles and cousins is the furthest out you can go. So. So in that subject, which I'm glad Graham brought up, does bring us into, again, sort of the issue of zoning and how you can use zoning to um, improve affordable housing. Do you think you can elaborate a little more on that stuff? You touched upon it already. I'm sorry, it kind of uh, glitched out a little bit on my end. Could you repeat that question? <laughs> I was saying uh, that kind of kind of leads us into the um, topic of zoning, as far as like how how can you use zoning or how can the local government use zoning in order to help with affordable housing? Yeah, so um, we can do what's called like overlay districts, which is basically like adding um, another type of zone over a zone. So you have things that are zoned single family, multifamily, whatever. You can kind of create another district that would say like, okay, in this district, this is where the inclusionary zoning would apply. So that's kind of what we were talking about before, where you know you incentivize what can be built there if people provide a certain amount of affordability or sustainability. Um, I guess beyond that. If we're thinking like like real radically about this, I think I think it's called Strong Towns is this org that has like some kind of cool ideas about how to build cities with a whole different approach to zoning. And like honestly, what what I think would be really cool to do long term is get rid of zoning. I think that there is a like racist and very problematic history to why we have zoning in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I don't think ultimately that it's really the best tool, but I think that's a pretty unpopular opinion, especially among like most of the progressives that I, you know, probably would need as allies. So I don't really know how far we can go with any of that thinking, you know, but um, ultimately I don't, I don't think that we're doing ourselves any favors by saying what can be built in the, with the approach to zoning that we have. I think instead just having rules around what can be built in place of what's already there would be better and actually would do a better job of incentivizing redevelopment of places where there already is pavement, where there already are structures and they're falling into disrepair um, rather than taking virgin land and just, you know, cutting down all the trees and putting in these big developments. But right now we see it, it's a, it's a lot more affordable and desirable for developers to go into undeveloped land that's zoned a certain way and just build what they can build there by right or even just go into undeveloped land and say hey we'd like to rezone it which they can you know likely get approval for if they entice us well enough um but you know we have a a, a whole lot of apartment complexes where you know many units aren't even inhabitable many others people are still living in but are full of mold and you know broken appliances and things and so I'd rather see us like redeveloping those places and so that's where we can also get into um, incentivizing that redevelopment through a series of tools that I'm still honestly like learning a lot about mm -hmm. um, but. and that actually you're bringing up the fact that that we already have hi Barbara thanks for watching 
Um, that's Barb. She's great. Um, tenant, I'm thinking about tenants' rights. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Um, but uh, the, these apartment complexes that we've had for a while now that are run, you know, terribly, uh, they're mismanaged. People have absolutely horrible living conditions. Everything's broken. Um, I think Athens Politics Nerd recently this year did like a, a, a um, maybe a video or, or an article about it, one such place. Um, one of many, but yeah, it was a great one piece. Of many. Yeah. Exactly. And so I'm curious what, at least for from the commission standpoint, what, what can be done about that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, you know, I campaigned on tenants' rights. I also campaigned against the single family ordinance. So <laughs> sorry to disagree with Graham so much on that, but I, I'm not a fan of that ordinance. But um, yeah, you know, one of the things I learned, it, it, I was near the end of the campaign when I learned this, which, which fascinated me at like how much even trying to have this conversation for so long, I wasn't aware of the right to repair already existing. Just one example, right? But like you as a tenant, you have the right to repair broken stuff in your house and then deduct it from your rent. It's called repair and deduct, I think is what you'd want to look up. So like Ooh. basically you have to, there's there's a little bit of documentation you have to do. You, you'd start by saying to your landlord, hey, this thing's broken, can you please fix it? And it's very important to do that in writing, right? So uh, sending that in an email or a text, even if you've talked to them on the phone, follow up with an email or a text so it's dated and it's time stamped and it's there on the record saying, hey, it was good to talk to you earlier. Um, thanks for offering to fix my fridge or please get back to me about fixing my fridge, right? Mm -hmm. And then if they don't do it in a timely manner and you know that is a flexible thing, but for things that are very essential, you know, HVAC systems, um, heating systems, refrigerators, um, things that have become conventionally certainly necessities for people now, mm -hmm. um, they need to fix a uh, timely manner is, you know, usually considered like within 48 hours, uh, usually 24 if possible. So like uh, if days go by and it's not being fixed, go buy yourself a fridge and then pay, deduct that $200 you spent on a fridge from your thousand dollar rent and give them an $800 check and a $200 receipt. That's totally legal. Um, so, so that's one thing I think. Now, th then we get into the issue of well, what happens for repairs that are much more expensive than your rent is? You know, the roof is leaking, the floor is, the floorboards are caving, you know, which is also a huge problem for lots of people in this town. Uh, and that's where I'm still trying to figure out what we can do legally, because there's so much um, preemption in Georgia law that doesn't allow localities to interfere with private contracts. Um, but I'm hoping that we can create some kind of a mechanism where people can, um, be able to back out of a lease when the place has fallen into disrepair um, and isn't being repaired. Um, Cause that's one thing like right now, if you're, if you sign a lease and then a tree falls on your house and your land, I, I know somebody who this happened to tree falls on your kitchen. The landlord doesn't fix the hole in the roof for months. You know, you have like a tarp over your kitchen for two months. Well, you're still legally obligated to maintain that contract for that house. And so like, I think, you know, you should be able to back out of that. And I'd love to, you know, maybe I'll keep singing this song and a month from now or in this chat, a lawyer will hop in and be like, oh, there's actually a law for that too. You know, I don't know, but I, you know, so far no one's let me know about that. Another thing I'd really like for us to do is uh, make it so that you have the first right to refusal on your lease up until I, I'm, what I'm starting with right now is 60 days, 60 days of its expiration, um, which would stop this issue we're seeing of people being asked in January, sometimes even like December, to renew their lease that expires at the end of July. Um, and if they don't decide halfway through their lease, you know, if they want to keep living in the same place with the same people, then their landlord starts shopping it around to someone else. Um, and that's where you see people having to move way more often than they need to. So that's another thing I'd like to see us change. Um, did that, did that kind of get tangential to what you were asking about or was that? Yeah, definitely. No, that, that was really good information. Okay. I'm so glad you brought up the right to repair thing. I hope people take that and write it down, bullet points. Repair uh, and deduct. So like anything, you're having issues in the workplace, you're having issues with your landlord. It's always important to document, document, document. And anytime you have something that's not recorded, write it down right away. If your landlord says something discriminatory to you, if your landlord says he's gonna do a thing, write down 
to the best of your ability exactly what he said and when he said it. Uh, having that documentation is what they look for in court. Um, and there, you know, Georgia Legal Services generally helps people with evictions. Um, but the last thing I guess I'll say here, I don't think we're going to get it in this budget cycle because there's so much we're trying to make happen and we're also feeling the squeeze from COVID. But my goal is to have a tenant advocate office or position set up um, in the next budget cycle. So fiscal year 23 is what I, that's kind of a goal I have. Um, something modeled after what they have in DC, which is called the Office of the Tenant Advocate. Uh, DC is a bit different, you know, cause it's a whole, DC as a city is very unique legislatively, but their their model I think is a cool one for um, having it, having legal legal representation available for people who are renting. Which really all of us need. That's awesome. I'm, I'm really excited to hear more about that as, as you get to push for that. I will say, I know that um, if you're looking to organize around housing, I know that Dia Dignidad Immigrante in Athens does have a group right now who is trying to organize around affordable housing. So if you're interested in that, reach out to them. Um, okay, we've got, well, we're going to pivot because we've got this, this nice comment from Mac. Um, He's saying, uh, given the anticipated population growth of NACC, do you think we will need to reconsider our green perimeter? Should we target some proportions of it for development? <laughs> oh no, your, your volume went out. But your sound went out. Oh, I muted myself because I was clickety clacking. I was trying to pull up links, which yeah. I think uh, Paul's shared over here in the comments now. Um, sorry about that. Um, I guess I'd be curious if Mac wants to weigh in on some more specifics about like like what he means by that. But in short, um, I think having um, some of that inclusionary zoning or overlay zoning in place, especially if we're starting to think about maybe like tax breaks we can give residents so that when the property values go up from the greenway and things like that, they're not driven out of their housing. Um, property tax freezes for people who live within a certain proximity of these amenities. Um, a low income homestead exemption is something the mayor and commission has requested from the state government two years in a row. And maybe one of these years we'll get something other than garbage legislation from them. And uh, this would be probably the best thing that could help working folks in this town stay in their homes. Um, but I don't, I don't think we need to sacrifice wild space or green space for affordable housing. I, I would kind of go back to similar to what I was saying earlier, redeveloping places that are already developed, um, you know, more density, I'd rather have taller, denser buildings where there already is development than keep cutting down trees and things. You know, athens Clark County has a goal of 20% um, wild space uh, land conserved. And we're, we actually have hit that number in terms of wild space, green space that exists in the county, but not all of it is protected. So we're still on this like quest to actually have enough of it protected. And if we start thinking about like the climate crisis and the role we play in our own small way, and trying to have a planet people can still live on in 20 or 120 years, uh, I think it's really important to maintain wild spaces. So, yeah. yeah. While we're talking about density and things like that, um, we have touched upon with each one of the commissioners so far, the fact that there's a predicted, I think, what is it, 60,000 more students coming to UGA soon. Um, and they're not gonna be building any more housing is what I hear. Yeah, so right now I think the number is about 300 more a year that we're getting. Um, the 60, that's, this is actually, I, I, maybe I missed a memo, 60,000 is not the number I've heard. Uh, I could be wrong, and I love it when I'm wrong. Uh, I also could be wrong. I feel like I'm constantly trying to keep my head above the water with all the information, so I might have just missed this very important piece of information. There's a very good chance you're right, you've been talking to all these folks, and I haven't even had time to watch the conversations before ours. Um, which I'm sure were fantastic because pretty much everybody's at least as are probably more knowledgeable than me about this stuff. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, the students are going to keep coming, no doubt. And UGA has made it clear that they ain't going to build any more housing for them. So it's going to have to be built in the private sector somehow. And, uh, and so that therefore I think the onus is on us to incentivize it being built in a way that doesn't continue to screw over everyone else who's living here. Um, and then, of course, you know, economic development that really helps working class people and drives up the wage floor 
uh, is is another key component because you know what you can afford become you can afford more expensive housing if you make more money. <laughs> so right. um, there is that too. Ooh, uh, this is a, a good comment from Alan, good buddy Alan, uh, talking about the the Linentown resolution. Mm -hmm and what can be done in the Georgia law to provide some sort of restoration for descendants of those thrown from their homes in the 1960s. So you'll probably hear people bring up the gratuities clause over and over and over again. And sometimes I think that gets used as a, a worthwhile, you know, legitimately legitimate caution. Um, but I would say sometimes maybe an excuse for an action. Uh, but sometimes it's pretty clear that this will be a violation of the gratuities clause. You will almost certainly get sued and you will definitely lose. Uh, and distributing money directly to people in Georgia is a very clear violation of the gratuities clause. And if we were doing that to only a portion of the residents, we can guarantee someone who's not getting a check will sue us. I mean, there's just, you know, there would be so many reasons for that. And then especially when we start thinking about the way racism motivates people extra. And if you know, so if we're taking a reparational approach with this. So all that to say, unfortunately, we can't do what they've done in Evanston here. Um, but built into the Linentown resolution was giving them uh, more direct access, the people who have been involved in that um, Justice and Memory Committee uh, moving forward, more access in the budgeting process. And so a component of the participatory budgeting that I think a lot of us are talking about, which can take many forms, is to have more participation from these residents in the budget decisions we're making so that we're better tuned to what they think the money should be, the money of our community should be spent on, the wealth of our community should be spent on, and can begin to you know, better and more clearly prioritize where that needs to go. Um, you know, beyond that, there are other ways that policy by policy, I think we're getting better at codifying equity and looking at historical inequity in where sidewalks were built, you know, where green space exists and saying like, if we're gonna be building new amenities, if we're gonna be um, prioritizing where the buses run, uh, where the parks are built, where we fill in the many, many sidewalk gaps, then we should be, you know, really focusing on places that have historically been um, marginalized or, you know, historically been African American neighborhoods, things like that. Um, the last thing I'll probably say about this for now is uh, has just fallen out of my head. Golly, I had it in my head. I should have written it down. I'm taking notes here as I go. I'll remember it once we get to the next question, and then I'll just try to revert back. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're good. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's very informative so far. Um, I'm thinking now about uh, jobs and wages, um, especially you know, given the the income breakdown, the median income breakdown that Mariah gave us earlier, um, being a really important number to look at. Um, and uh, we've talked about with each commissioner so far also how like what the commission can do, which of course, because of the gratuities clause and other limitations on local government, not a ton y'all can do necessarily about wages, but there's a few things, right? And mm -hmm. I wanna kind of lay that out, what you think the local government can do about raising wages, because that's a huge part of affordable housing. Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll share two things, at least to start. So one is we can, and, and just, I mean, you've probably talked about this before, but like another George, great Georgia law is that we're preempted from being able to um, raise the minimum wage. The Georgia state law doesn't let us just raise the minimum wage for everyone in Clark County. Um, but we can set a wage floor for our own employees. So having been a part of the fight for living wages for county employees for many, many years now, and we had a victory at the time that, uh, didn't go quite as far as I think we hoped it did at the time and that t temporary and seasonal employees have still been left out of that r rise in the minimum wage, mm -hmm. but that was incorporated into the budget at the time. And so now years have gone by, cost of living has continued to go up. So what the MIT calculator cons considers a living wage is now more than a dollar higher than what it used to be. Um, so we have a bunch of people who still haven't caught up even with just the MIT living wage calculator. Now the MIT living wage calculator you know, we've been using what it, what they calculate a single person without kids needs, which is not, of course, a living wage for anyone with kids or certainly disability, thing like that, you know, things that require more medical care, uh, 
cobbling together, living between multiple part-time jobs, et cetera. And the MIT figure is also quite conservative. It's a conservative figure, you know? So if we're thinking in terms of justice and like wealth in the community, wealth in the country, um, it should be way above what they talk about. Uh, I was on a call a while ago, a number of other commissioners were too with um, Richard and Sujata Winfield and Nene Onyeha Clayton who have been involved a lot in um, this kind of work. And they're really pushing for $20 an hour. Um, I love their bold ambition. I'd love for us to put in place a plan that phases into that as our minimum wage here in Clark County. Um, but the reality of budget limitations and the way that, you know, going from what's currently some people getting paid nine and 10 an hour, um, although all full and part-time people are making at least um, 10, 60, which is what we won a few years ago, but there's temporary and seasonal who are a bit below that. Um, getting all those people up to 15 and then dealing with the kind of wage compression question of people who are currently making 15, like giving them a bit more too, is going to be a pretty big hurdle to get over first, especially if we're doing it in a way that redefines the way we approach wages in Clark County to have a living wage floor and to define how it will go up over time. Um, so my hope, and this has been expressly shared by a number of folks on the commission, is that in this budget cycle, we will get a minimum wage floor of 15 an hour established for everyone, including part-time and seasonal, and then put in place a living wage policy that mandates how that will go up over time, as well as how to equitably approach that issue of com compression so that we are raising the wages of those middle income people, um, but not necessarily raising the wages of the upper income people who don't need any more, you know? Mm -hmm. um, the union that Tim's worked with, the UGA union, UCWGA, um, they had a policy where to deal with wage compression that I thought was really great. And I, if I'm getting this right, and did you talk about this with Tim already? Which part, sorry, I was reading. The, the living wage policy that the union had for how to deal uh, with compression. No, wage I don't wage think compression. I don't think you brought um, that up. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, for anybody who's watching wage compression, the idea is like, when you bring up the floor, uh, it kind of squishes everyone who is in the middle uh, closer to the floor. And so, you know, don't they deserve more too? And I think to some degree, especially when you're thinking about like employee morale mattering, you got to, you have to like uh, deal with that a bit. Um, but oftentimes how that's dealt with is everyone gets a 2% raise or whatever. And I just don't think the people in Clark County who are already making six figures need a 2% raise because we bring up people making 10 bucks an hour to 15. Um, but I do think people who are making 15 an hour might deserve to go up to 16 or something, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, so, so to deal with uh, wage compression when you're trying to bump up the minimum wage, especially more and more over the years, their solution was to say, we'll do cost of living adjustments where everybody's increase is based on a percent, 1% or 2% of the median income. So that's a real substantial raise for the people who are currently making below the median income, right? Mm -hmm. That's like a, that's much greater than a 2% raise, it's like a 5% raise or something, right? But then for the people who are making 100K a year, you know, 2% of 38K a year isn't this huge amount. And so that actually enables you to give everybody a raise still, acknowledge everybody's contribution, give everyone a raise, but, but do a better job of helping most of the people who are currently paid the least, which is ultimately, I think, what we need to do. Um, the other thing I think we need to do, and this is not currently a popularly held opinion, although I don't think I'm alone in this, is I think we need to redefine the scope of work of our economic development department. Um, I, I think we need to take a good hard look at how that department functions and get it to work not just on recruiting industries that employ a lot of people at once. Um, you know, one major thing is to, I feel like we're still kind of having this conversation around getting the economic development department to focus on wage floor of the industries they're bringing in and not just median income of the employees of industries they're bringing in. Um, but more broadly, I think we need our economic development department to focus on industries that are already prevalent in here that aren't going anywhere. Um, I think there's this myth that the way out of this problem is to educate people into better jobs, quote unquote, better jobs. And that just like ignores what I would like to think is a more universally understood lesson after this year, which is that there's a lot of essential work That's right. that you don't need a master's degree to do. And yeah. like people who are stocking grocery shelves 
and people who are you know cleaning bathroom facilities, people who are doing landscaping work, they deserve a living wage. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to just educate them to get a different job. I want to value the labor they're doing, which is very valuable and essential. Um, and so I think our economic development department would do well to build that into some of its work too and say like, how can we do a better job? Cause I don't have all the answers. No way. You know, um, even my best ideas aren't going to go anywhere without really collaborating with other people, especially people who know more. So an economic development department, that's really bringing, you know, economists and business people and advocates and activists and actual working people together to say like, what can we do to improve working conditions and wages in service industry, in retail, in these places that aren't going anywhere that make up a huge part of our economy, um, but are not typically the task of an economic development department. And then also better funding the development of cooperatives is mm-hmm. another uh, big thing they can do. You know, I, I look at like organized labor, which is something that we need to support as being part of a path toward the workers owning the whole deal, which is what a cooperative is. And so finding ways to incubate more co-ops, I think would be a really valuable investment. Um, Not just small businesses, but specifically small cooperative businesses. Uh, And then one more thing, I know I said two, but now I'm given four, is HR policies. You know, we would do well, I think, to uh, incentivize better HR policies for private employers um, and also maybe strengthen what we look for in our contracting or what we look for in industries that we try to recruit here. Um, so like offering beyond what's the minimum here in Georgia or the norm here in Georgia. Part of what makes Georgia, you'll see this advertised, the number one most attractive place to, to bring your business to is that our wages are low and our regulations are shit. And so like, it would be great if what we could do is make this, make Athens a great place to work because the workers are like paid and treated well. And so paid family leave, bereavement leave even, um, and uh, sick leave, and then also just like good vacation packages, but also good uh, benefits packages, including for Mm part-timers. And then I'd really love to say like, hey, if you have these policies, my favorite of which is a just cause clause. So it's a clause that you put in an employment contract that you can only be fired for just cause. It's the opposite of what we are as a state, which is an at-will state. You can just be fired at will. Um, And so say like, we'll give you uh, part of the package of getting your tax break to put your business here is that you do you go through this checklist and on that checklist are these HR policies. Um, so we can kind of subvert the crappy labor standards of Georgia um, by bringing in industries that still get the benefits that you know make Georgia a good place to bring a business. Um, and they get the tax break that the county can offer to incentivize them to come here, um, but they're going to actually pay and treat their employees well. That sounds great. Yeah. Um, I want to get to to Broderick's question. Um, how can we revisit the housing ordinance to include multi multi family zoned districts? We sort of uh, went into this, but if you could answer more specifically, I guess to this. Yeah. Oh, and I think he's he's apologizing for the typo. He's, he's okay. infill housing instead of Indio housing. Although Indio is a cool town in California. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have no idea what Indio's housing policies are, but. Uh, yeah, so the infill housing ordinance, that would be an example of those overlay districts you're talking about. And so it basically says like, you can only build here things that are similar in scale. And sometimes it also gets into like historical preservation, like architecturally similar to what's already there. Um, and uh, how's this question worded? Uh, any, um, yeah, so I mean, in short, having infill housing as part of our package of like more inclusionary or zoning or like affordable affordability oriented zoning is a key thing. How we go about the details of that um, is hopefully part of what that working group that the mayor set up is going to go through. Um, but, you know, beyond that, I would go back to saying, you know, again, might not be a real popular opinion and I have lots of things where I have an opinion and I'm not necessarily like hundred percent confident. So maybe I'll change my mind about this in a while, but like long-term, I actually think it would be better for us to have everything be able to be multifamily, to do away with the idea of single family zoning. You know, people don't like that because it's bad for property values or something, you know, but uh, because people don't want, quote unquote, that element, whatever that is, you know, next to them. Um, But ultimately, I think you still keep some zoning. You keep industrial zoning, you keep conservation, things like that, wild space, but you blur together all the residential and commercial to just be 
residential and commercial. Um, and then you put in place policies such as infill housing policies. I mean, that infill housing ordinance is very similar to the kind of stuff that the strong towns model is based on, which is basically like that you have to build similar to what's already there. You can't build by right anything that's, um, they basically they set up like tiering. There's like sizes, you know, say like seven tiers. And if this house is a tier two size, you can only build a tier two or tier three size house in its place. Mm -hmm. If you want to go bigger than that, you have to go to the mayor and commission for approval. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess I'd like to see us doing that. Uh, the way it's currently being proposed in some places is a good step for now, but I think it'd be much cooler if we just made that the default for how everything here <laughs> works. So. Yeah. Broderick, I hope we answered your question. I know we, we've sort of been going back and forth talking about zoning in different at different moments, um, but yeah. let's know if we didn't. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I also want to point out that it's not just the scale of housing driving up property values that's, that's driving people out, that phenomenon that Broderick's speaking to. It's also that amenities that make neighborhoods more attractive there than, you know, like the Greenway. I mean, we're going to see as we have this bike pet infrastructure and this trail infrastructure and these parks and these green spaces expand, we're going to see property values go up in a lot of places. So like the, the goal of taking a more equitable approach to green space is going to have the results of driving up housing costs in those very neighborhoods. So we need to have mechanisms in place now that safeguard against that phenomenon. And, and that's where I think the property tax freezes is another key component of this. Um, where are we at with those property tax freezes? Cause I remember that there was. So <laughs> there was actually this like last minute deal making going on at the Capitol mm -hmm. and I didn't get an update. So I, I, I wanted to arrive here knowing, and I don't, I'm sorry. Uh, I, 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 I think I would know if it passed. So I think it didn't. Um, but basically, Houston, beloved Houston Gaines, um, responded to our request for a low-income homestead exemption with a blanket doubling of the exemption for everyone. Classic yeah. Reaganomics, rising tide lifts all boats kind of thinking, uh, which would have just like gutted our tax rolls and given tax breaks to rich people the same as low-income people. And so uh, that's not what we're looking for. <laughs> um, and what's called a floating homestead exemption, um, which is where you can have like a, a floating mechanism for who it applies to and mm -hmm. have it apply to certain income tiers. Um, and then basically you qualify for it uh, through an application process. And then each year when you file your taxes, you just kind of uh, show again that your income is still within that bracket, right? Below that amount. And as long as it is, then you maintain your frozen property tax and your property tax stays frozen at whatever that first year is that you apply um, and then remains there until you either move or um, your income goes up. And then if your income goes up, your property tax goes up to whatever it would be for anybody else. If your income goes back down again, then it's frozen again when you apply again. Um, so I think that we don't have that and we will try again next year. Uh, we need the state to let us put it on the ballot as a referendum. We can't just do it ourselves. There's so, so many state seats that might be up for grabs. Soon. Yeah. And this starts to speak to, yeah, this is why we really need different people in those seats. <laughs> yeah. Because um, another key thing is that these decisions are made by the local delegation. And then they bring it to the full body to vote, but the full body is just going to vote for whatever the local delegation wants. So literally just flipping even one of those two state house seats, assuming that when they redistrict, we still have three, um, would just would change the dynamic to have two Democrats instead of two Republicans. Or maybe, you know, maybe we get real lucky and we get a Democratic Socialist in there. That'd be great. We'll try. Um Oh, I forgot that there there was a question that that uh, a friend had in a chat that I was talking in. I was going to try and find it. Um, oh, okay. Um, they asked one of the things I'm still chewing on from last week is how the commissioners made it sound like the city was very beholden to developers to get things done. Um, if if there's no other way to get housing built. And they were asking for a little more insight into 
why that function couldn't be done by the city, um, which I think we've touched upon, but maybe we can really lay it out here. Um, yeah, so the county can put money, I mean, city county unified government, I guess is the thing that's, you know, we can say city, I think we know what we mean by that, but for, for the nerds out there, our city county government is unified. So um, anyway, um, our, our county government just doesn't have the funding to build a whole ton of housing, right? So usually we incentivize development through tax breaks and things like that, but we do have some. So I don't think we should pretend like there is nothing that we can do besides entice private developers to do better. Um, although that is, I think, the where the most housing, the private sector is going to continue to build housing no matter what. So we need better laws and better incentives no matter what. Uh, but, I, and I don't see that question in the chat, so I'm doing my best to try to remember what you said. But um, I think where we also would do well to recognize is like we can invest in housing of certain types and it just gets a lot more complicated. And so the redevelopment of North Downtown the North Downtown redevelopment, the Bethel redevelopment is a great example of this, I think. I'm really excited to see where this goes. I hope that I don't look back in two years regretting how much I and everyone on the body, the mayor and commission is currently celebrating it, but it really looks good right now. Like I think this is an example of doing it right. Um, there is a private developer involved still because so much money is required to build this stuff. And so the units are gonna be broken into three tiers equal parts, equal thirds. So a third is gonna be market rate and that's where these private developers make their money. Um, but then they also, they get some tax breaks from the federal government and stuff. It's like kind of incredibly complicated how many funding sources there are for all this to make it work. And then a third is going to be, um, I guess what we could call like mid-level affordable. It's like partially subsidized. And then a third is going to be folks who are like living in a voucher program like have a voucher and are like somewhere between very low or no income can live there too. And they're all going to be in the same place. The number of units is thirds, but there's no like segregation between the like market rate and the affordable units. So, you know, you won't know when you move in, whether you're living next door to someone who's living there entirely on a voucher or who's paying market rate. Um, and I think that's a really, really great model for us to keep trying to find ways to replicate moving forward, but it's an incredibly onerous and slow and expensive process. And the fact is that our population is just going to grow more rapidly than we can go through that process to build that way, which is why incentivizing the private sector is so important. But I think we can and should do more of that. The other thing we can do, and we didn't get into this at all, is we can rethink um, other aspects of housing where we can have a, a more like major effect right away. And so there's a, a, tend toward, a, a trend right now on the commission and the mayor agrees towards housing first approaches to homelessness and providing housing to people without any kind of requirements put upon them about what they need to do in order to retain it. Um, and so I think the best the, the best way forward for us to address the housing crisis for the people who are the most vulnerable is for us to acquire more property. Um, ideally, again, property that's already built and just like rehab it and then uh, partner with independent agencies, you know, nonprofits to manage those properties and get people into housing who want it and currently don't have it at all. Um, a key, key thing for everyone to know when we talk about this is you need a lot of money beyond just the money to build the place or repair the place. You need the operational funding to keep it in shape and to provide the social services that you usually try to pair with these buildings for people to have access to like employment pro like programs and, you know, substance use rehabilitation programs, things like that. Like, like the reasons why people end up unhoused are widely variable and some people are gonna be fine if you just give them a place to put their head for a little while, but most people need some kind of extra help. Um, and so having those social services present is a key part of what makes these programs work. They've been employed in other cities and the state of Utah is actually like a statewide example of this. Um, and so we need more of that, I think, but that that's going to involve having to really move a lot of our general fund money into the operational costs. And yeah. so another thing that I'm hoping will be in our budget this year is establishing a partnership with an independent agency, TBD, but probably the Athens Area Homeless Shelter, 
um, and maybe also Advantage, who we already partner with, continuing to do that, um, to uh, provide more operational funding so they can maximize the use of the facilities they already have, which are currently underutilized. And then also, hopefully, we use some of the less leftover SPLOS money, the affordable housing bucket of money that was used for Bethel, yeah. to acquire more property. And then we can also, then we would need more operational funding to make those work too, right? Um, but the real crux of all of this is operational funding right now. Right, right. And and finding the right, yeah, the right uh, mm -hmm. co-partners there. The, um, so y'all can, y'all can, and you're looking into the idea of like acquiring a kind of property, like an old hotel or something like that. Yes. And then yep. partnering with someone else uh, to yep. kind of run it. Is that, is that, is that right? Yeah, so basically like the county would acquire either the land something would be built on or the property, including the building, mm -hmm. and then would um, either continue to own, but like lease, you know, for like a dollar a year to an agency, the management of it, or could then turn it over, you know, through one of our development authorities, some kind of an agreement. There's like technicalities you have to go through legally to do this, turn over the property to one of those agencies. So it can go kind of either way, um, but the county can purchase that, Kind of stuff and that is something that we are looking looking toward so and yeah i see charles hardy say which would take years that's absolutely true and that's why we need other stopgap measures in the meantime and so like fun, i mean the work that charles hardy's doing um to just like meet the need in the streets for people right now and the work that the athens area homeless shelter is doing to meet the needs of families and children who are homeless which is less visible to a lot of people but is actually like a huge number of people um, I think I think the number is over 900 kids this school year that the school district identified as housing insecure. Um, and then, of course, the family members that are associated with the adult family members associated with those kids. Mm -hmm. um, so there really is this need for us to put money, operational funding money into the community partners, the nonprofits in town that are already doing this work to fund what they're already doing while we find ways to get more facilities built and operational. Um, and then, uh, we didn't get into this at all. I, I, I'm wearing this shirt and I feel like we just need to talk about the fact that like, there is another housing that the county provides and it's for incarcerated people. And, uh, it doesn't look a whole lot like housing. It looks a lot more like caging and it's awful. And I think that we really need to rethink, uh, how that's built and how the people who live in those places, many of whom who are laboring for the county for free are treated. And um, that's a, honestly, I'd love to have a conversation on just that if we wanna do another one of these in the future, is like how to tackle inmate labor and the relationship the county has with our jail and our prison and the transition center. Cause I think there's a lot of stuff that they're doing that's really good. And so if we're going to keep those facilities here, I mean, we have to keep the jail here. If we're gonna keep the prison here, I think we need to invest much more in the people who are housed there, who are held there, you know, um, than we're currently investing. Um, we have gone through a bunch of really good things and I don't want to skip over. Roderick's had a lot of good questions and comments in here that I wanted to try and catch up on. But uh, talking about payment in lieu of taxes for UGA to pay into affordable housing fund is a great idea. I have no idea what uh, leverage the, the the ACC has. Yeah, I was so I was I had a I, I had a really good conversation with this guy who teaches for the ACCG, the Association of County Commissions of of Georgia, um, and uh, he he taught this class on tax and finance and stuff, and we talked about pilots and. One thing I realized is that I think I've been misusing the term pilot in that it's usually used as a way of incentivizing industrial development, such as like Caterpillar got a pilot, mm -hmm. where they you you get uh, an institution that would have to pay taxes makes a payment in lieu of those taxes, which is usually a lesser amount than they would have to pay in taxes. And then sometimes you can do cool things with it, like earmark it to go to something different. Um, UGA is just tax exempt. So they're never having to pay taxes. When they buy land, they just get it. And so a huge part of what hurts our tax rolls in Clark County is that a massive amount of land is owned by the university and they don't pay any taxes on it, which is why we end up with things like 
um, stormwater fees, because that's a way of getting money from the university for those many, many, many square miles of land that they've built upon that they don't pay taxes on. Um, so I, I share all that, not to say that we shouldn't do this. I, I think what Broderick's getting at is important. Uh, mm -hmm. I just, I'm realizing that I probably need to come up with a different word I use other than pilot, because I think it's maybe confusing for people. But the truth is, or or we as organizers and public officials need to do a better job of widening the scope of how we define pilot to say, well, it's not just for people who have to pay taxes. We also want to have things like that for people who don't have to pay taxes, but should be investing in the community more in these ways. Mm -hmm. um, how to get the university to do that <laughs> is its own separate huge can of worms. And uh, I think we're gonna need more consensus on the commission before we could use some of the powers the city might have to play hardball with the university. Right. Um, Cause you know, Playing nice has led us to end up in what I've referred to as an abusive relationship. You know, I think it's kind of been that way uh, all along for the people of Athens. But as the county government has become, I think, you know, a better representation of what people here want and need, um, it's also become a, a more antagonistic relationship between the county government and the university. And, you know, their, their lack of will to engage in the Linentown resolution. Uh, never mind any of the bolder stuff that that resolution seeks to lay the groundwork for, mm -hmm. I think is a great example of why they don't share the same interests. And so we need to find a way to make it appealing to them um, or to play hardball. And there's a great example of a community, I forget which one right now, um, there's a university town and they told the, the university like, we're going to shut off your water if you don't do this. It's not what Selmy was talking about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like, I think there's things like that that we probably could do or we could threaten to do. Yeah. Um, but the only way that's going to happen is if there's a stronger consensus on what needs to happen among the commissioners. I don't think that currently exists yet. So so there's some work to do there um, on the commission. Oh, gosh. Wow. Is that a cat? Probably. I don't know. Yeah. We're breaking stuff. Anyway. Um, it's we're we're a little over an hour, um, so I want to be respectful of Jesse's time um, and, and everyone watching. Thank you all so much. So many good comments and questions, and this is clearly something we can continue to do. We can continue to talk about these things, um, and I think we should. Um, Jesse, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, really appreciate the. the many, many uh, good bits of information that you had for people. Um, if anyone wants to ask you questions or reach out to you or follow things that you're putting out there, what's a good way to contact you or to follow what you're doing? Yeah, so the best way when I'm on the internet like this and who knows where it's going to end up, I usually give my email, which I just put in the chat. And yeah, now there it is, jessehoolatacgov.com. That's the best way to reach me. And then uh, if you have my cell phone number, then calling or texting me on my cell phone is definitely the best way to reach me if it's in a time crunch. And if you don't, then please just email me so I know I'm giving it to a real human being and then you'll have my cell phone number too. Uh, and that's a great way to reach me. Uh, and so everyone who would participate in this chat, please get in touch if you want. I mean, the truth is we as county commissioners don't have staff. So a lot of how we get to understand the picture, never mind develop the policies that we need is like collaboration with people who know what they're doing and have the time to help. So like, like I need help. I think the other folks that you have had on these calls, like we all really want uh, help from the community to write these better policies and to get them passed. Um, and then also, uh, I'm just gonna say, Charles Hardy, I talked to uh, Jose, but I don't have your contact info. So please get in touch with me because <laughs> I would love to talk with you more uh, to, to get a stronger, just like firsthand uh, experience with you out, out doing the work that you're doing. That's awesome. Um, yeah, well, thank you all for being here. Um, this is not at all the end. We will keep talking and keep pushing for better change for all the humans that live here. And uh, I hope you all have a beautiful weekend. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for being here, everybody. For sure. Thanks, you all. <laughs>